ISO 26000 Canadian uh, um, representatives that participated in the ISO 26000 process. Um, he was the industry designated industry person on that particular process, and he has, uh, uh, as a consultant through his uh, BRI group, he has assisted a number of different organizations in Canada with their uh, use of ISO 26000. And um, he's now, as we know, uh, involved uh, in Mexico. Um, um, he's the founder of something called the Mexico-Canada Responsible Mining Network, which is basically looking at evaluating the impact of Canadian mining operations uh, on the environment and adjacent community in Mexico. He's involved in teaching at a variety of different uh, professionals uh, at a variety of different uh, universities, five in Mexico, several here in, in uh, Canada, including Ryerson. Uh, and he is uh, um, the founder and chair of the Pekanka, um, he will uh, pronounce that correctly, First Nation Working Group, where he uses the standard to contribute to sustainable development in the Northern Ontario uh, community, with the highest suicide rate in the world. Um, he's also been involved in a number of different ISO standards. Enough uh, of me presenting about him. Let's pass, pass things over to him. Bob, please take it away. <clears throat> Thank you, President, and hello, everybody from Mexico. Uh, day three. I'm here to. Are, are you getting me? Uh, I think what you said is you're hearing some feedback. You're, we're not getting any feedback from you, Bob, but, but you were cutting in and out now that you began to speak. I'm not okay. sure what the answer is to that. Perhaps you have a um, uh, an actual microphone. That, that you can use uh, uh, to speak in as opposed to using your uh, uh, um, uh, computer's microphone. But if not, what I would suggest you do is just proceed to speak because I think what happens is uh, the more it becomes clear to the computer that it's only you speaking, the more it allows you to just speak. So let's let's try that. If not, we're going to have to go to mine, which is, I don't think, the best I know, your forte and smoke signals again. Um, so let's see whether or not we can just use the, the microphone technique to start off with. So, so say uh, uh, several sentences and I will give you a thumbs up allowing you to continue to talk or not. But I'm going to try not to interrupt you because I think that's the critical thing to um, the way your computer microphone works. Proceed. Okay, I guess the first thing I would say is that the promotion for the uh, event talked about the uh, uh, the standard makes an important statement of the global community concerning what is expected of organizations on social and environmental issues. I would say that in my own experience, it's been much broader than that. And I found that ISO 26000 to more in, in representing a statement concerning what is expected of organizations on ethical behavior and sustainable social, environmental, and economic development. And I think David, when he started, he mentioned that the, the definition is accepting responsibility for the impact of activities and decisions on society and the environment through transparent and ethical behavior. So in effect, this is an excellent guide on what is ethical behavior. And what I found in, in consulting and, in, and teaching uh, and, and using the standard is this great understanding of what is ethical. And in fact, Virtually everybody says they are ethical. So you start from a perspective where you're trying to teach people about how to be ethical when they already believe they are ethical. And then the misconception comes around in terms of values. So people believe that I follow my values and therefore I must be ethical. And of course there's a major concept of values and ethics. So I find 26,000 is a great Guide. So, for the last 16 years, I've been teaching graduate engineers at Ryerson, so maybe 6,000 engineers, uh, on what is ethical behavior for engineers. And 26,000 have been a great help in, in showing the broad perspective of that, uh, especially given that they, they come into the classroom all believing that they are ethical. And so, trying to break through what ethical really is. Uh, the Mexico Canada Responsible Mining Network came about because of complaints about Canadian mining companies in Mexico and the impact they were having on 
the, uh, the communities, adjacent communities. And I was uh, advising the government here on uh, the adoption and use of standards uh, for uh, uh, sustainable development, CSR. And so I was asked to, to look into a couple of complaints, uh, one sign out in the water, uh, another one that the indigenous people were not being engaged. And I found 26,000 was an excellent framework, benchmark, to evaluate the behavior of, we, and we, took, we started with two Canadian companies, and we formed the mexico Canada Responsible Mining Network with two Mexicans, two Canadians. The uh, one Mexican was Lily Granillo, who was the uh, academic representative from Mexico. She's a professor at a number of universities here. And the other one was uh, Ricardo Sepulveda, who is a human rights lawyer, who is now the head of human rights for all of Mexico. Uh, and then the other person in Canada is uh, a Catholic priest. The idea was that we, we felt Canadian owners don't know what they don't know about what's happening on the ground here in Mexico. So we would go in uh, from an objective perspective as volunteers, we would meet with the community, we'd listen, we'd evaluate, we'd evaluate what they said against what ISO 26000 said they should have been doing, and then report back to the president of the company. And so we had two of those. Uh, one, we had to bring in the CSR commissioner, uh, uh, Marquita Evans. But eventually, the outcome was getting the Canadian owners to engage in dialogue with the, the people in the community. And that was a, that's a major breakthrough and a major accomplishment and what people want here. Uh, then the, the next area on the Ganshigam, uh, in 2011, uh, I was teaching at U of T, and one of my uh, students was the assistant to the coroner, the uh, deputy chief coroner of Ontario, who was doing so asked me to look into, read his report on the Ganshikam First Nation, where 16 youth had committed suicide in the period of 2006 to 2008. I met with him and commented on his report, and they asked me to formalize it. And so I used 26,000 to evaluate uh, the, what I was seeing in the Genshkin and what uh, I felt needed to be done to contribute to sustainable development in the community. The coroner asked me to join his government working group. I said, no, I'll start a private sector group. You join our group. He did. And so since 2011, we've been working with chief and council in the Genshkin First Nation to develop a long-term strategy for this community of 3,000 people where uh, there's 50, uh, only 50 of the 450 have water, working with them to address the issues of sustainable development using 26,000, especially the, the uh, uh, 6.8 on uh, a community involvement in and uh, development. Uh, so uh, that's what I've been using in the standards. Uh, Curran mentioned uh, uh, sustainable procurement when I first got involved in that standard. I found lots of opportunities on your, in the areas of governance, uh, in ethics, sustainability, where you could enhance those sections using guidance from 267. So I did that in uh, uh, ISO 207, 200 for sustainable procurement. I'm also the vice chair and editor of uh, ISO 2700 for management consulting. And I did the same with that standard. And uh, it's been a great uh, source of guidance. So it's not Bob White's ideas. It's here's what 450, 500 people in the world said to find social responsibility. So the committees have been very open to accepting the guidance. So if you look at 9,000 or uh, 2,700, 2,400, uh, I did it. Uh, in 2000, I guess 2009, working with the Vancouver Olympic Games when we were working on a new CSA standard for sustainable events. Again, the committee was very open to adopting guidance from 26,000. In fact, they changed that CSA standard from certification to shall and should. So they, they were in a hurry to get certified for the Olympic Games in 2010. So they adopted 26,000 and made it shoulds. So it, that's been my experience uh, with uh, industry. Probably the biggest single event was uh, getting the uh, Canadian Electricity Association to adopt 26,000 as the framework for sustainability. 
But one little comment, I, I've noticed when they combined 26,000, which they require all members to use, when they move forward to verification, they use GRI. And I, I saw differences, and I, they're in a paper I wrote on the living wage, where I see differences in what we have in 26,000 and what is in GRI. One specific case has to do with 26,000 focuses on suggesting that you identify the needs of all stakeholders, including your employees. And so you look at the employees, the local pay, paid employees of the community, you would have to look at their needs. Where the GRI focuses on the minimum wage. So there are some differences, and organizations need to be sensitive when you're combining two standards like GRI and 26,000 to understand both of them and pick the best of both. That's all I would say. Thank you, Kernan, for this opportunity. Thanks very much, Bob.